how you find vertical asymptotes. So for now, let's suppose you have vertical asymptotes over here and over here. You have two of them. You have two vertical asymptotes. It divides the region. It divides the plane into three regions. One, two, two, and three. You have four vertical asymptotes. It divides the board into five different regions. N vertical asymptotes, N plus one region. If you come to learn that you have a point here and a point here and I don't know, a, a point here and also a point here. And the horizontal asymptotes is say here, you have a point there and a point here. And the dashed line was the horizontal asymptote. Well, this graph on the right end point goes like this. On the left end point, it goes like this. If in the middle, both points are down here, then it goes up, maxes somewhere, and comes down. Take the first derivative, find out where that max point is. If on the other hand, they weren't both on the bottom, if they were both on the top, if you learn that as x gets close to these x values, the function goes here and here. They, they both go to positive infinity. Well, then it will come down, have a min right there, and go back up. The two other cases would be if one's at positive infinity, approaching positive infinity, and the other one is approaching negative infinity. Positive infinity, negative infinity. Well then, it goes something like this, and it has a point of inflection, say, right there. Take the second derivative, find out where the point of inflection happens to be. If the last case is if you have one point up there and the other point down here. Well then, it goes that way. Now, the last thing that I'll say is, let me work on the right end point, excuse me, the right region. If you know that as you approach C from a little bit above C, it goes to positive infinity. And let's just call it value D. And as X goes to positive infinity, it approaches D but from below. Initially we had it above and we went this way. What if it's approaching D, but, oh, but when X is really large, it's approaching D, but always a little bit less than D? Well, you have to be asymptotic to this line. So it's approaching infinity that way. As X gets larger, it has to be going this way. And as X gets close to C from a little above, it has to be getting close to C. I mean, and this is basically close to positive infinity. Which means it does this. It's probably be easier if I just saw it from scratch. It will go something like that. Which means it has a min. Not necessarily on the x axis, but it has a min. Likewise, on the left hand point, you know it's approaching D. As x goes to positive and negative infinity, the y value keeps getting closer to d. But let's suppose always a little bit more than d. Always a little bit more than d. For example, if you have d plus 1 over x, this is always more than uh, x squared x squared. Well, 1 over x squared, when x gets really, really large, whether it's positive large or negative large, 
this value is very, very close to zero, but it's always more than zero. If you have D and you add a little or a lot, you're more than D. Okay, this graph has to get closer and closer to the vertical asymptote. Got to get closer and closer to it, and also get closer to D. Okay, that didn't look so hot the way I drew it, so let's try it again. Got to get closer to both asymptotes. Something like that. And not only are you going to have a max, you're even going to have a point of inflection. Same thing all the way to the right. You'll have a point of inflection, say, right there. And the second derivative will tell you. Okay, now, sometimes you don't even need to take derivatives or anything. Well, at least you don't have to take their second derivative. Most times, fortunately, functions don't behave like I did through. Functions behave a lot more nicely. That is, if they saw a negative infinity, they're going to approach the horizontal asymptote from below, like that. If they're the positive infinity, it'll approach the horizontal asymptote from above. Now, here's going to be one really unusual function, off-the-wall function, where it's not going to be, the concavity is not going to just always be positive. It is it's most always going to be nice and smooth. Of course, there are some very, very strange functions out there. And trust me, people have studied these functions in the greatest of detail because it's so unusual. That is, you're probably not going to get one like that. And if you did, you'll see right away it's unusual. It's going to have natural logs in it. It's going to have trig functions. It, it, it's going to be very unusual. Okay. Now, you're going to have to take a derivative for the middle region. Now, when I say middle regions, if you have more vertical asymptotes, well, then you have more middle regions. Middle regions is anything but the end. That is, this here is the middle region, this here is the middle region, and those x values is our middle region. When you have a middle region, at both points, in, at the ends of those regions are either both at positive infinity or both negative infinity, well, you can take the first derivative to find the max. If, on the other hand, one is at negative infinity and the other end of their interval is a positive infinity, you're not going to have a max or a min. You're going to have a point of inflection. So you can take their second derivative there you see where it equals zero. But I'll tell you straight out, if this is C and this is D, the max is going to happen right at their average. If this is E and I already called that D, the point of inflection is going to happen at its average. Or maybe a teacher never proved that and as a result doesn't want you to use it. Okay. Now that I thoroughly confused you, let's see how we put all those things together. Let's see how we know at asymptotes if we're at positive infinity or negative infinity. But here's the story. At asymptotes, you will be at infinity. The question is whether or not it's positive infinity or negative infinity. We'll start off with a very simple one. Sketch the graph f of x equals 1 over x. Because the record, we know this one. At least we should. It looks like that. But let's graph it using this new method. First thing is, is we want to find the horizontal asymptotes. And now I'm going to call them HA. 
you want to find the horizontal asymptote. And that's what happens when x goes to infinity. Well, the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x is, is 0. But always a little bit more. Always a little bit more. Because if x is positive, the numerator is positive, and x is going in the positive infinity, it's positive, it's always a little bit more. And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 1 over x, well, the denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's going to 0. But the numerator is positive, and the denominator is negative. Positive over negative is always negative. If x is really, really large but negative, negative 50 billion, 1 is positive, negative 50 billion is negative. It's really close to 0. Try taking a pizza pie and breaking it up into 50 million pieces. I mean that the slices are going to be 0. Like, don't even bother. If you're inviting 50 million people, to an event do not come with one pie for everyone. It might as well come with nothing. It's the same. Okay, so we have that. Okay, now, I wrote it out nice and big, but in upper corner, I want to keep records. Smaller record. As x goes to infinity, y goes to zero plus. As x goes to negative infinity, y goes to 0 minus. Those are the information about the horizontal asymptotes. You have a vertical asymptote, better known as VA, vertical asymptote, when the denominator is 0 and the numerator is not. Well, the denominator is 0 when x is 0. But the numerator is never 0. So when x is 0, the numerator is, like always, 1. When x is 50, the numerator is 1. Okay, so now whenever you have a vertical asymptote, you have to look at the limit as x goes to that number, but a little bit less. x goes, in this case, to 0, a little bit less. And as x goes to 0, but a little bit more of the function. Well, you have 1 and you're dividing it by a number very close to 0. You have 1 and you're dividing it by 1 over a very, very, very small number. A very big number. What is it? 1 million. So you're dividing 1, that 1, by 1 million. Well, the rule for dividing, if either the top and the bottom or both are fractions, is to keep the numerator. I did that. Change division to multiplication. I did that. And flip over the bottom number. Well, dividing by 1, you don't have to do. Nonetheless, this is large. I mean, it's 1 million. If I made the denominator even smaller by doing 1 over an even larger number, well then, I will get an even larger number. And if I let the denominator get smaller by making it in, by making by dividing one by even a larger number, or an insanely large number, one divided by ten to the fifty billion, well, you're gonna get a really, really large number. Okay? But it's it's going to infinity. The, in both cases. The question, so what I want you to learn is 1 over very, very small is very large. It's very large. Take your calculator and convince that of yourself. Take 1 and divide it by 0 0.00003231234. It's going to be infinity. Your calculator might give you an error saying it can't compute such a large number. Okay. Now the question is back here now. You know the answers at, at vertical asymptotes are infinity. 
is it positive or negative? Well, the numerator is always positive, and the denominator, well, it is always going to be negative. X is approaching zero. There's always a little bit less. A positive over a negative is negative. As x approaches zero, but a little more. Well, one is always positive, and x is always positive. It's a little bit more than zero. It's positive. So it's approaching positive infinity. So let me erase an awful lot of this. Let me put down the information that we just obtained. And then we'll set up the graph and then we'll graph it. We just learned that if x goes to 0 minus, y goes to negative infinity. And we also learned that x goes to 0 plus, y goes to positive infinity. You don't need to rewrite what I'm writing in the top right hand corner. It's just that as you see, my board space is complete. I have no more space. So I wrote everything big and then I put it in the upper right hand corner smaller. Okay, the next thing we want to do is just find their intersection. If there are any. Okay. Let us find their y intersect. Uh, y intersect, that means the other letter, x, is zero. Well, there is no y when x is 0. It is, remember, this is another, another name for f of x is y. y is this. If this is 7, then y is 7. If this is 99, then y is 99. y equals whatever this is. For when x is 0, you get 1 over 0, which is garbage. So, you have no y intersect. So whatever happens, don't cross the y axis. No y intersect. Way too many students, they might get no y intersect, but it's amazing how when they draw that graph, as clear as day, they cross the y axis. If you claim there's no y intercept, don't cross the y axis. And if you claim there's a y intercept at 7, well then cross it seven. Okay, so let's put these pieces together. We have a y, a vertical axis until it's zero. This happens to also be the y-axis, but I don't want to draw it bold. Every time you have a y-intercept, you should draw a dash line. If the y-intercept, maybe you should, because the y-intercept is solid. But for argument's sake, let's leave it this way. We know that it is. So the horizontal asymptote is zero. When, getting, when x gets really positive large or very negative large, we're going to zero. In fact, as x goes to positive infinity, I'm reading the first one, I'll be a little bit more than zero. As x goes to negative infinity, I'll be a little bit less than zero. As x goes to zero, but a little bit less. That is, when x is around right there, a little bit less than zero. y is going to be a negative infinity. y is getting negatively large. When x is a little bit more than zero, a little bit more. Zero plus means a little bit more than zero. y goes to plus infinity. Okay, so I'm up here. And I don't cross the y-axis. Well, there's no middle regions, you only have n regions. One on the left, one on the right. It is, the graph just looks like this. Notice, I'm not saying it's easy what we just did, but notice I never even took a derivative. I mean, if you wanted to, you, can, you should think of f of x as x to the negative 1. And the first derivative is negative 1 x to the negative 2 which is negative 1 over x squared, which is never 0. It's never 0. And it's undefined at 0. That is, there's no derivative at 0, but that makes sense because it's not even defined at 0. 
Okay, this makes no sense when x is zero. Because there's no critical value. The second derivative I'll take from here is negative 2x to the negative 3, which is negative 2 over x cubed. Well, if x is greater than 0, the bottom will be positive and the top will be negative. So if x is greater than 0, this is going to be negative. That is, it's concave. Concave up. Hmm. Oh, like I, I think I said it, like negative 2 comes down and it becomes positive 2x to the cube. Neg positive 2 over x cubed. Well, the numerator is positive. The denominator, if x is bigger than 0, is positive. That's why it's always concave up when x is bigger than 0, x is 0 right there. And if x is less than 0, the numerator is positive, and the denominator will be negative. You cube a negative, get a negative. Positive over negative is negative. So to the left of 0, that is less than 0, it's concave down. But, but we already had that. We already had that. You want to do this? Do it. I wouldn't. Each of my want you to. Personally, I would not as an instructor. I would not tell you to do that. In fact, I'd be quite depressed about how I would have to take points off if you made any mistakes when you did stuff you didn't need to do. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention about this problem, f of x is equal to 1 over x, is that this is an odd function. All the exponents of x are odd. That means once you figure out the right half, the left half comes for free. Okay, you need to relearn or relook at how you draw an odd function given when x is positive. How do you draw the region where x is negative? Look at this pre calc video that I have. Okay. So suppose you were asked to draw this function. Suppose you were asked to graph f of x is equal to x squared minus 9 divided by, say, x squared minus 25. So, the horizontal asymptotes. The limit as x goes to infinity of our function is just going to be 1 because the degree of the top is 2 and the degree of the bottom is also 2, so I divide the numbers in front of them, which are understood to be 1. 1 over 1 is 1. But you know what? Even if I let x go to negative infinity, negative infinity, it doesn't care because it's squaring. It's squaring. Doesn't matter whether you plug in 79 or negative 79. Or if you plug in really, really large positive numbers, or that same really large negative number. Whether you plug in 1 million or negative 1 million, you're going to get the same answer. So it turns out that it's 1. The question is will it be a little bit more than 1, or will it be a little bit less than 1? Now, can we make life? Oh, okay. So the question is, will it be more than one or less than one? Okay, well, the numerators, they're both starting off with the same number. Okay, now remember, and we're talking about when x squared is really, really large. Really large. So, the numerator is really large. It's you know, a really large number. And the bottom starts off with that really same, 
that same real log number. Right now, it equals 1. Well, how do you tell if our fraction is more than 1 or greater than 1? If the numerator and the denominator are a positive. If x squared is really large, it can only take away 1. It'll still be positive. If x squared is really large, it only takes away 25. It's still positive. The numerator will always be larger than the denominator. You have a really large number. And here's 0. You have a really large number. And in the top, you just take away 9. And in the bottom, you take away 25. The bottom is going to be closer to 0. That is, this will always be bigger than 1. It's always going to be more than 1. Why? Because the numerator is larger. Okay, taking away the 9 from their large number is going to become less and less significant as that number gets larger. For example, if somebody owes you $10, but they pay you 9 less, I have a feeling you're going to complain. Somebody owes you $100, but then $9 short, well, you'll be less pissed off. Getting $1 instead of 10, that's a big difference. But if, if somebody owes you this amount of money, okay, you know, billions and billions, but they shorted you $9, I have a feeling you're not going to say a word. You're just going to be the happiest person in the world. But you couldn't possibly spend this money. You couldn't possibly even tell me what that number is. So they short you nine dollars, you're not, you know, you're going to smile all the way to the bank because that nine becomes less and less significant. Okay. So here's one of those unusual cases hmm, where the limit, well, maybe not. So let me not say it. Okay, so we just found the horizontal axis. Now what we want to do is find the vertical axis. So it's probably best if we factor the denominator. The numerator is x squared minus 9. And the bottom is the difference of squares. X is being squared here. And 5 is, you can realize 25 is 5 being squared. So you write down x and 5 two times. Put a plus in between 1 and a minus in between the other. So the possible vertical asymptotes are plus or minus 5. Now whether you plug in plus or minus 5 and put it in top, you're going to get 25. And when you take away 9, you won't get 0. 25 minus 25 is 0. 25 minus 9, whatever it is, 16, 98, doesn't matter. It's not 0. A vertical asymptote is a number that makes the bottom zero but not the top. So we found our two vertical asymptotes. So now we have to look at the limit as x goes to 5 from above. We have to look at the limit as x goes from 5 to below of our function. And that's to care of 5. We also have to look at the other vertical asymptote, negative 5. As x goes to negative 5 from above, what happens to y? And as x goes to negative 5 from below, well, what has happened to our y value? Which is also known as f of x. Now, we know the answer is infinity. We need to decide if it's plus or minus infinity. That's the whole job now. Is it plus or minus infinity? And how we're going to tell is as follows. Uh, if, x, so if x is anywhere near 5, we try to do all those, these two in one step. If x is anywhere near 5, when you square it, you'll get near 25. And if you're anywhere near 25 and you take away 5, You'll be positive. Okay, now let's look at the first factor in the bottom. 
x plus 5. If x is anywhere near 5, and you add 5, if x is anywhere near 5, and then you add 5, you'll get near 10. That's positive. If x is anywhere near 5, and then you take away 5, that's a problem. Because if you're more than 5, just a little more than 5, and you take away 5, will be positive. If you're a little bit less than 5, you have $4.99, and you go and you spend $5, you take away $5. You owe somebody, you're negative. Okay, so when is x minus 5 greater than 0? When x is greater than 5, which is what the top one says. A little bit more than 5. A little bit more than 5. So that will be positive. And when you divide a positive by a positive times a positive, you get positive. In this case, infinity. If x is a little bit less than 5, and you take away 5, it's negative. In this case, this overall sign is negative. Negative infinity. Now let's talk about when x approaches negative 5. If x is negative, anywhere near negative 5, you square it, you get near 25 for the numerator, and then when you take away 9, the numerator will be near 16. Anywhere near 16, you're positive. Okay? What if you, let's do this faster first. If you're anywhere near negative 5, if you're anywhere near negative 5, and then anywhere in here, and then you take away 5, you'll be around <laughs> negative 10. That is, you will be negative. This factor will be negative if x is near negative 5. Okay, what about the first factor on the bottom, the x plus 5? That one is 0 at negative 5. So a little bit more, a little bit less. This shading matters. Shading a little bit more than negative 5 versus a little bit less. Take away 5 from both sides. You conclude that this factor is greater than 0. That means positive. Only if x is more than negative 5. Well, that's the first one. Negative 5 plus. The overall sign here is negative. So, it's negative infinity. Uh, yep. X plus 5 is only positive if x is more than negative 5. But here we have that x is less than negative 5. That is, it's going to be negative. Okay, and in the bottom, you have a negative times a negative, which is a positive. In the top, you have a positive. Positive over positive is positive infinity. Okay, now we are in a position to graph this. But again, since I ran out of room, let me write down the information that we have. Actually, let me just graph it here. Oh, the other thing is, what is the y-intercept? The y-intercepts are x values that make the numerator 0. It's when this is 0. But this being a fraction, it's 0 when the top is 0. Why, why don't I buy that? No, y-intercept is when x is 0. So y would be negative 9 over negative 25 which is 9 over 25. So, we have the one that's X axis, Y axis. Uh, when X, the horizontal asymptotes are both, um, both being a positive infinity and negative infinity, they're both a little bit more than zero. So I do that little bit more than zero. And the vertical asymptote, so I took care of both of those pieces of information. The vertical asymptotes are at negative 5, so I'll call it negative 5, as well as positive 5. Okay. 
So now, let's plug in the information about the vertical asymptotes. The first one, I'm a little bit more than 5 at my positive infinity. A little bit more means to the right. To the right of the vertical asymptote, I'm at positive infinity. Okay? A, a little bit less than, a little bit to the left of 5, I'm at negative infinity. I'm down here. Okay? A little bit to the left of 5. 5 is right there. Okay, now we go on to the other vertical asymptote. I'm a little bit more than. That plus sign is important. That means to the right of negative 5. A little bit more than. From a little bit more than negative 5, I'm at negative infinity. That's what it tells me. If I'm a little bit less than, that's what this minus means. I'm a little bit less than, which means to the left of negative 5, a little bit to the left of negative 5, what do you know? I'm at, I'm at positive infinity. Okay, now I am ready to graph it. And this is what we, we reviewed initially. The left hand coin goes like this. It keeps getting closer to the horizontal axis. Horizontal axis. It gets closer and closer to the vertical axis. It never touches. The right end point goes like that. Gets closer to both of those, the vertical asymptote, that is this dashed line up here, this graph is going to get closer and closer to it, and it gets closer and closer to the horizontal asymptote. Okay, and we have to cross at not the y-axis and 9 over 25, which is less than 1. We happen to have learned one is there from the limit, the horizontal limit. So 9 over 25, well, that's even less than half. It's right here. Okay. And like I said, so it's going to go something like this. The question is, where's the high point? And like I said, it's going to be between negative 5 and 5, which is 0. What's in between negative 5 and 5? 0. So it turned out that y-intercept was the max. But if you need to calculate that, well, you need to calculate it. Let's do that. Let's take the first derivative and see where it's a max. And if our graph is correct, there's only one max. Alright, so since it's a fraction, we use the fraction rule. It's a, so I'm looking at f of x. It's the derivative of the top times the bottom. Minus just the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is 2x. And all of this gets divided by the bottom all squared. bottom is going to be 0, making the derivative undefined at plus and minus 5. But the function is not defined there. They were the vertical asymptotes. Okay, so here we have 2x cubed, and here we're going to take away 2x cubed. So that cancels out, and you're going to have minus 50x. And why don't we just do it? We have 2x cubed, minus 50x minus this would be the 2x you get 2x cubed minus 18x well 2x cubed and 2x cubed times the subtraction way by the them negative 50x minus negative 18x well, that's minus 32x over x squared minus 25 squared. This is 0 when x is 0. That fraction is 0 when the top is 0. Well, 30, negative 32 times some number is 0. That number, which we happen to be calling x, is 0. 
That is, we have our critical point at zero. There it is. Okay, so if you want to use the calculus to verify it, there it is. Okay. These are long problems, which in a way is good because the teacher cannot give you more than one of these on the test. So we shouldn't. And they can't be the hardest ones. That is, you won't have five vertical action codes because, you know, when you give an exam, you should just find out if the students know how to do it. If you know how to do what I just did for two vertical action codes, well, then you can do it for five. For why waste the students' time? Now, how about you have a problem like this? Suppose you have f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 4. And you want to divide this by x minus 2. Okay, you want to divide this by x minus 2. Now, you, you can see, I'm going to erase this in a moment. You can see that the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity is going to be plus or minus infinity because the, actually it's just going to be plus infinity, isn't it? No, that's not true. It's going to be plus or minus infinity because the numerator has the higher power. Okay? The numerator being squared, whether it's positive or negative x, that is, if x is going to positive or negative infinity, the numerator is just going to take off and be positive infinity. Okay, but it's going to be square. It's going to go to infinity much quicker than x. Okay, that is, when x is very large, x large, this is approximately x squared over x. But that equals x. Okay, when x is really large, it's going to plus infinity. When x is really large, f of x is going to negative infinity. But now, the thing is, is there something called a slant asymptote? I know that when x is really large, it's going to infinity. But now, you can go to infinity, say, following this path. And you can go to positive infinity following this. That is, when x is small, it can be whatever. But once x starts getting large, it starts getting closer to this graph. Or, or, maybe when x gets large, it gets close, say, to the absolute value of x. Remember, the graph that looks like x squared is going like this. For now, it can be chaotic in the middle. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, here, it's going like this. And now it's getting close to this line. And now it's getting close to that line which is way different than, than, the, than this curve. Okay, so it'd be nice if we know, yeah, it's going to infinity, but it'd be real nice if we knew exactly the path it was going to start taking when x is real large. And this notion is called slant asymptote. What happens? What does the function really behave like when x is large? We can do better than what I'm about to erase. We can do better than that. Basically, you do the long division. But if you're clever, you can get out of doing the long division here. You can notice that in the x squared minus 2x, that if you fetch it out in x, what's left over is x minus 2. That's x squared minus 2x. 
plus 4. Now, when you divide by x minus 2, like it tells us to do, when it divides by x minus 2, it cancels out, and you get x plus this. But now, when x is really, really large, this goes to 0. It's a coincidence that I got the same answer a minute ago. Okay, it's just the coincidence. Now, you really should try to practice doing the trick I just did. Because the alternative is to do long division or synthetic division. X goes into x squared x times. Multiply this x by x minus 2 and put this answer right here. I guess in this case it isn't bad. Subtract, and you know, this cancels out, and negative 2x minus negative 2x cancels, you just get 4. And since the degree of 4 is smaller than x minus 2, that's your remainder. 4 over x minus 2. So in fact, this function is exactly x over x plus 4 over x minus 2. And as x goes to infinity, x goes to so when the rate for long division work. And then we ignore the part that goes to zero. That is I am looking right here. I'm looking right here. And as x goes to positive or negative infinity, this piece goes to zero. So, we now know that, I should have the function here after that. We now know this limit is x. That is, I'm going to get closer and closer to y equals x. Remember, whenever you take the limit of f of x, you're finding the y value. And that's the y value. As x goes to plus or minus infinity, y behaves just like x. Okay, all I'm saying is, so here's your coordinate, and here's the line y equals x. Okay, in this little region here, but right now I have no idea what's going on. It can be real chaotic, but when x gets sufficiently large, it's going to start getting really close to that line. It could, it can end up getting close from above. It could get closer by crossing its infinite number of times. Getting closer. Okay, so all we know now is that f of x gets close to x. The line f of x equals x as x gets really large. F for x approaches the line y equals x when x is very long. That's what we learned from doing the long division. And taking the limit of it. Remember, this equals this, which equals this, which equals f of x. Okay? So, we didn't just want to know if the limit's infinity or not. We want to know what the function was. When x is really, really long, if x is a hundred million, a hundred million plus four over a hundred million minus two, you know what that equals? That equals a hundred million. Okay? At least it's really, really close. Because this number is so small. And I know I only wrote a hundred thousand. Okay, if there's three more zeros for the hundred million. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, this is approximately zero. So, you get what x is. If x is a hundred million, that's what f of x is. Okay. So, if somebody asks you, what is f of, you know, three trillion? You can say, oh, it's around three trillion. If it's 
turned out that this wasn't x, but it was 2x, then you would say it's 6 trillion. All right, so I hope that went over well. But nonetheless, this requires not 10 minutes of studying. All right. Now, vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes. What makes this bottom zero? Two. So we have possible vertical asymptote at two. The question is, does it make the top zero? Is x squared minus 2x plus 4 is 0 when x is 2? Well, 2 squared is 4 minus 2 times 2 is 4. Well, that there is 0. And when I add 4, it's not 0. Okay, so we do have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And I don't know why I just wrote 2. I should write x equals 2. So the vertical asymptote at x equals 2. Okay, so now the classroom code stuff. We look at the limit as x goes to 2 from above of x of x. And I know the answer is infinity. And I look at the limit as x goes to 2 from below of good old f of x. And I know the limit is infinity. Okay, the question is plus or minus. Well, if x is anywhere near 2, I think we just worked it out. When we plug 2 into the numerator, we got 4. So if you plug in a number really close to 2, 1.9999 or 2.0000, you're going to get close to 4, which is positive. Okay, now, if x, now we look at the denominator, which is x minus 2. If x is near 2, you can't tell me if x minus 2 is positive. Okay, why? Because at 2, it changes signs. A little bit more than 2, it'll be one sign. A little bit less than 2, another. When is it positive? Oh, it's positive. That is, this factor is positive when x is more than 2. This says more than 2. Positive. This does not say more than 2. Negative. So, it's positive infinity here, negative infinity here. So, it's a positive over positive is positive, and a positive over negative is negative. Okay, so, that information, and one last thing. What is the y intercept? It's me standing right in the bottom. We know that we have a y-intercept when x is 0. Well, when x is 0, the numerator is 4, and the denominator, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. So we get 0 comma negative 2. So 4 divided by negative 2 is negative 2. So that's where the y-intercept is at, 0, negative 2. Okay, so let us graph all this stuff. Let us graph all this stuff. And you can notice, we're going to graph this and know the derivative. So, x axis, y axis. I know that the horizontal. Actually, it's not called a horizontal asymptote, mainly because it's not horizontal. It's called a slant asymptote, because it's on a slant. Y equals x, we should know that that looks like this. So when x is extra large, the graph is going to get closer to that red line. And we only have one vertical asymptote, and it is at the number 2. There it is. So the vertical asymptote at 2. Okay. Now, let's see. Let's go back to our slant asymptote. 
when x is really positive, when x is really positive, this part will be greater than zero. Just a little bit. Because for the, you know, a real large number minus 2 is really large. And 4 divided by really large is positive, but very small. And we have x plus very small. It's going to be a little bit above it. It's going to be a little bit more. y is going to be a little bit more than x. It's going to be x plus 4 divided by a really large number minus 2 which should be a little bit more than 4. And if you have x plus 4 over x minus 2, if x is very, very negative, well, this part will be negative. Because the bottom is negative, and 4 divided by a negative number is negative, and adding a negative number is the same as taking away a positive number. Very, very small. But nonetheless, it's a little bit less than x. For an x, you're going to take away a little bit. So it's going to be right below y plus x. But nonetheless, the hard on the last is just x. The limit is just x. Okay, now let's see what happens. So we just dealt with hard on the last uh, for some reason, I'll deal now with the fact that we cross the y-axis and negative 2. Now, so I dealt with the slant asymptote, I dealt with the y-intercept, now vertical asymptotes. If I'm a little bit more than 2, I go to plus infinity. A little bit more than 2, I'm at positive infinity as opposed to negative infinity, which is down by the x. Next one, we did this one, next one. From a little bit to the left of, a little bit less than 2, a little bit to the left of 2, negative infinity. To the left of 2, and then negative infinity. Okay, so now I have to go from here to here. There it is. I have to go from here to here, but cross that point. Okay. Now, it turns out that in both of these graphs, we do have a min value. It's not necessarily right where the y-intercept is. You could take the derivative to figure that out. And in fact, we will. Okay. So you notice that I'm graphing it without doing any calculus. That is, I'm not taking derivatives. I'm doing now to keep our teacher happy, or just in case we want to know. Now, after we just fast it or do, did long division on f of x, we realize that f of x is nothing more than this function. I'd rather take the derivative of this than this nasty fraction. But I will say one thing. I'll rewrite the second factor as 4 times x minus 2 to the negative 1. So when I take the derivative, the first part is easy. The derivative of x, oh my, that's 1. Couldn't be any easier. Bring down the negative 1, that becomes negative 4. Take the new power of 1 less, negative 2. Take the derivative of what's in there, which is 1. So I get 1 minus 4 times 1 is 4. And since this is a negative exponent, I'll put it in the denominator. Okay. Now the question is, is when does this equal 0? Well, if you have 1 and you take this messy looking part away and you get 0, oh, that messy looking part is 1. That part must be 1. 4 over x minus 2 squared must be 1. 1 minus, and all I'm using is the fact that 1 minus 1 is 0. 
1 minus 1 and 0. So the messy looking odd, it must be 1. Okay. I can deal with that. So then 4 over something, namely x minus 2 squared, is 1. Ooh, ooh, that's 4. 4 over 4 is 1. 4 over 4 is 1. So the denominator, something squared, is 4. Well, what do you square to get 4? 2 or negative 2. So x minus 2 can equal plus or minus 2. Add 2 to both sides. x is 2. That is 2 that I just added over. Plus or minus 2. Well, 2 plus 2 is 4, and 2 minus 2 is 0. So, we just learned something. The min value over here happens when x is 4. The max value happens coincidentally at 0, when x is 0. Now, if you want to find the max, well, I meant to say the min plus 4 in. I think the function was x plus 4 over x minus 2. Well, if x is 4, this will be 2. Because 4 minus 2 is 2, and 4 over 2 is 2. So, it's 4 plus 2 or 6. This y value is 6. The y value for this max here, we happen to already have found earlier, is negative 2. Okay. And for whatever it's worth, uh, you should have seen all of this except for taking the derivative in pre-calculus. Okay, let's see if we should bother to do another one. Here, let's look at this one. Suppose the f for x is equal to x over the square root of x squared plus 2, I guess. Now, let's just review something. A lot of people would say the square root of x squared is equal to x. Well, let's see if that's true. Let's see if that's true. I'm going to plug in 5 for x. Well, 5 squared is 25, and the square root is 25 is 5. I let x be 5, and I got back 5. Okay? Looks like it's x. So now, if I let x be negative 5, and I square it, it tells me to square x and then take the square root of that. I square negative 5, I get 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. Oh my! I need to get back x. It's not equal. It's not equal. Well, what's happening? If I plug in, say, 6, let x be 6. 6 squared is 36. Square root of 36 is 6. I plugged in 6. Out came 6. Well, what happens if I plug in negative 6? Well, I square it. I get 36. Well, the square root of 36 is 6. I plug in negative 6. I get back 6. I plug in 6, I get back 6. I plug in 5, I get back 5. I plug in negative 5, I get back 5. There's a function, another function that we're all very, very familiar with that does things like that. That function is called the absolute value of x. For example, the absolute value of 5 is that number. The absolute value of negative 5 is that number. The absolute value of 6 is that number. The absolute value of negative 6 is that number. The square root of x squared is not x. The square root of x squared does not equal x. So, we need to somewhat understand that for when we take 
problem is that infinity, that is when we look at horizontal axis. Okay, so that's the first step, is we want to look to see what happens as x goes to, say, infinity. And let's now, when x is really, really big, you can ignore the plus 2. When x is really big, you can ignore the plus 2. And then you get x over the square root of x squared, which is x over the actual value of x. And since x is always positive, the actual value of x is positive. X. The actual value of x is x. So this just goes to 1. x over x is 1. Now, let's see what happens when x goes to negative infinity of x of x. Okay, well, when x is really big, even negative, and you square it, it's so, so big. Adding 2 doesn't mean anything. You get x over the square root of x squared. But we just talked about that. The square root of x squared is absolute x. But when x is negative, the absolute value of a negative number, the absolute value of negative 7, is that same number with the minus in front. Fine, it's 7. But it's also that same number with the minus sign in front. The actual value of negative 13 is negative 13 with the minus in front. That, now I'm telling you x is negative. I'm just going to negative infinity. The actual value of this negative number is that same number with the minus sign in front. Well, x divided by negative x is always negative 1. x divided by negative x. x is understood to be positive. Positive over negative is negative. And as long as x is not 0, and my goodness, it's nowhere near 0, near negative infinity, you get 1. You divide the same two numbers, you get 1. That's why the horizontal limit at negative infinity is negative 1. Yeah. 
power you get zero. And it certainly doesn't equal zero because the top is never zero. Okay, so there's no max or min. And the second derivative is probably going to be have a six. It's six x. In fact, it's going to be negative six x over x squared plus two to the five half. The bottom is never zero. If the numerator is, this is zero when x is zero. Okay, so now we can talk about concavity. Now we can talk about concavity. Okay, we can make up our table. The only x value that made the first or the second derivative zero was zero. So we go from negative infinity to zero and then from zero to infinity. And we can look at the signs of the first derivative and we can look at the signs of the second derivative. Well, the first derivative. The numerator is always positive and x squared plus 2 is always 2 or more. You raise 2 or more to any power, you get positive. Always, regardless of what x is. Now, the second derivative. The denominator is always 2 or more. Raise it to any power, it's positive. The denominator is always positive. So, so this factor, negative 6, is negative, and the denominator is positive. Well, if x itself were negative, then the numerator will be positive, because the negative times the negative is positive, divided by the positive in the denominator, and you get a positive when x is negative. Which are these numbers? If x is positive, negative 6 is negative, x is positive, a negative times the positive is negative. So the numerator is negative, and the denominator is always positive. Negative over positive is negative. Okay. So, with that table over here, with this table here, and knowing that the right horizontal asymptote is 1 and the left is negative 1, and finding out the y-intercept, we will be able to graph this. We will be able to graph it with that information. Okay, and for practice, do in fact find those two derivatives. The first and second derivative of x of x. So, the last thing, like I said, was is to find the y intercept. That means x is 0. So, y is going to be the top is 0. And the bottom under the radical is at least 2, 2 or more. In fact, it is 2. 0 over square root of 2 is 0. So, the y intercept is at 0, 0. Okay? So, we'll live up to that. The y intercept is at the origin. I know that when x gets very large, it gets close to 1. In fact, since it's only when x is large, positive, we'll only draw it to the right. One. And when x is very negatively large, it gets closer to that line. Y equal negative 1. And I know I crossed the origin. Now, I know that the slopes are always positive. So, it's somewhat going like this. But we need to put some more flavor in. We need to know our concavity. Well, to the left of 0 is positive. Which goes like this. I didn't mean to start going up. It gets closer and closer to the horizontal line. And then to the right of zero, the concavity is negative. So I go this way. There's your graph. There it is. 
Okay. Hours and hours of studying, folks. Good luck with it.